everybody, welcome to the Winner's Circle on the It's More Than Just Money Movement channel. And as usual, I'm bringing you amazing guests that are doing amazing things, more specifically in South Africa and internationally. And to, today I've got nobody other than Mr. Justin Harrison. Harrison. Welcome here. Thank you very much. Thank you, for, to be with you, thank you for coming through. My pleasure. And you know, we've been having a lot of conversations before we started rolling the camera. <laughs> and I wish a lot of, well, actually I wish the entire conversation was captured on camera. You know, how you tell, you tell your story about where you come from, where you started, the fact that you've been homeless, the fact that you built a successful business, the fact that you do everything that you do simply because you want to give back to society. A lot of people, when they do something, they do it and then they say, how can I monetize it? Yeah. And they monetize it as quickly as they can. Now, you're a successful entrepreneur. You're an author of seven books that you wrote within six months. Yeah. And you wrote these books during lockdown. And all of them are personal finance book, yeah. books. So which means this is something that you that is a part of who you are. Yeah. You're not trying to teach finance. You are, you are a working finance person. Where does that come from, especially for a guy like you who was homeless, had nothing, started from nothing? So I'm a hustler. I'm a, I'm a hustler, right? Yeah. And uh, you can see the back yeah, he of gave, my he gave me He gave me this armband. Hustle makes muscle. Muscle, right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I stumbled into the world of, of being a, an entrepreneur, a business owner. Yes. At the age of 13. Because my parents couldn't afford to buy me school uniforms. They couldn't afford to, to give me the stuff that I, that I needed. Uh -huh. And I arrived in a very privileged place because I could play sports. I got a bursary to go to school. Yeah. And I arrived there and I saw all these kids had all the latest Nikes and the latest stuff. And I realized the only way for me to compete was to get some of this, right? Because their parents were giving it to them. I wasn't getting it. So the kids were from wealthy families. Exactly. Yeah. And so I, I think there's, there's magic in that. It's sometimes magic to be put in a place where you, where you are less, where you've got to fight to get out of that position. And so at age 13, I started cutting hair. And, uh, you know, by age 15, I think it was, I bought the school tuck shop, sold it back to them when I matriculated. What? Bought the school, uh, when I bought the school tuck shop, I was 15. You were 15? 15. In grade, grade 10? So standard eight, I don't know what the new grades are. It's a so grade 10. Yeah. Add two, right? Um, and then, you know, I, I, by the time I matriculated, I'd already had three or four businesses under the belt. I bought my first car with five rand coins from cutting hair. I had ice cream tubs full of five rand coins. And you bought a car with it. I bought a car with it. And, you know, started, started little businesses. I was the very first person to import creatine into South Africa. It's the stuff that all the guys use in the gyms. Um, sold that business, got into another business. Unfortunately, uh, got defrauded out of a lot of money. And because of my ethics and my values that I believe in and I live by, I intentionally chose to go homeless. I know this sounds really strange, but I felt a commitment. How to do pay. ethics make someone intentionally go homeless? Because the only thing you have in this life is your name. It's the only thing you have. Yeah. So money, money is temporary. Money comes and goes. Money flows. But I realized very young, my name is everything. So I had a lot of debts in that business, like most businesses do. You've got a supplier here and a supplier there. And I made sure I got all of my assets together. I sold them and paid off my suppliers. I made sure the businesses got paid that were supporting me. And because of that, I lost my house. I lost my cars. I lost my clothes. I lost everything. I sold everything, literally everything. I was down to one suitcase and I made sure my suppliers got paid. And it's amazing because there was a lady who came on my TikTok account from knowing me 25 years ago. And she made a comment and she says, I know this man. I know this man. He, I've seen him walk in and pay his accounts when he didn't have to. This man can open a line of credit anywhere on a handshake because of what he did 25 years ago. And so that, I think, is a very powerful message, right? And so I land up... That your name is more important than money sometimes. Well, it, no, not sometimes. All the time. All the time. It's yeah. the only thing you truly have. You will, money will come and go. There will be times in your life where you have a lot of money. There will be times in your life when you won't have so much money. Business is about good times and bad times. Yeah. But the one thing you must protect is your name. And I knew that very young because I didn't come from a family of privilege. I didn't come from a background of privilege. And so I landed up initially uh, sleeping in the old health and rackets. I had friends 
because it was one of the businesses I originally owned, and I'd sleep in the gyms at the Health and Rackets. Eventually, I didn't want to be a burden to anyone, and I landed up on the street. And I, I remember that journey, and that's part of the reason why I'm so connected to helping people, because I really know what it means to struggle. I know what it means not to eat a meal at night. I know what it means to go hungry when the stomach is hurting. I know that feeling. I know what it means to eat bread only to fill the stomach. I know what that means. And so I'm very passionate about, about breaking that cycle. And so, you know, a lot of stories I can tell about how I got back on my feet and, and the journey to that. But when I eventually started making money again, I took the active decision to spend a lot less than I earned. I took the decision to live a very frugal, simple lifestyle because I understood that money is a conjure to everything you want. And money is like any resource. If you don't manage it, you can get as much of it as you want. But if you spend too much, you're going to be in trouble. So there was a time in my life when I was starting out, I was earning $10,000 a month. After, yeah, yeah. We, took, we took about 20 plus years ago. Yeah, that must have been like what, 20,000 20, rents. Back then, I think the exchange rate was about five. Five mm. Okay. And I, I was living on 800. And I slept on the floor for two and a half years before I even bought a bed. Because here's the thing. I was just grateful to have a roof over my head. I didn't care about all the other nice stuff. And so I have this philosophy around money, which is in order to become very wealthy, you need to learn to accumulate it first. And most people, every paycheck they get. Gotcha. Every single cent goes out. The debit orders hit that account by the second they've got no money. And then people wonder why they can't generate wealth. They can't generate wealth because they're not learning how to hold on to money. People think if I earn more money, I'll become wealthy. No, you won't. You earn more money, you'll spend more money. Because you used to do it. Right? That's the lifestyle creep. I call it lifestyle creep. So, so where did you learn that from? Was it because of the first business not doing well that eventually made you to, to say, I don't want to see myself back there again? Because you had, you started making money early, right? You bought the tuck shop, you operated it. I was a millionaire at 20. You were a millionaire at 20. Yeah. Right? And, and a million back in the day was, was a shitload of, of money. money. Not, like, not like today. It's not like today. Today, today a million is nothing, nothing. Right? So a millionaire then was an actual millionaire. Yeah. yeah. And, and how did you lose that money? Maybe let's start there. It's an interesting story. And, and then from there, I want to tie it into... Then you coming back, yeah. building up now with a different mindset, if the mindset was different. It was very different. So, so I, I had figured out by the age of 20 how to sell, how to make money, how to trade. I'd figured out how to get money. But I hadn't understood the other side of the equation. And I think this is the part that's missing for a lot of people. Most people have the ability to make money. In fact, my argument that I say is most middle class people will see more than a million through their hands in their working career, right? The problem is they don't know how to hang on. Sometimes even within a year. Exactly, right? And so I, that money, and it's very ironic because I was telling you I'm 8% Nigerian. I was defrauded. You're going to get into that. <laughs> I, I was defrauded by Nigerians in my yeah. business. It was a very long story, but anyway, I lost everything, right? Everything. How old are you? 21. You're 21. So I wanted to make a quick buck. I was, I was, I was not cautious enough and I was driven by the two things that drives every bad decision, greed and fear, right? And so I made a bad business decision and that bad business decision cost me everything. But it's the greatest lesson I ever learned because I understood at that point when I went back to zero, I took a blank piece of paper and I said, what are the mistakes that I made? And I realized that I knew how to make money, but I didn't know how to hang on to money. And I realized that if I want to create generational wealth, I've got to actually learn about money. And so I went right back to the origins of money. Where did it start? Bartering. You got a donkey, I got two goats. Then we went to gold and silver coins so that we have a standardized medium of exchange. Then gold and silver, the Chinese came along and invented paper money. Then paper money became digital money. And so by studying that evolution, I realized one very important thing. It's the most important message you're ever going to hear. Money's not wealth. Money is not wealth because it's purely a medium of exchange. So, so there's someone listening to you now and you're saying money is not wealth and they're going, whoa, what do you mean? I want money because I want to be wealthy. I want to give a shout out to Julius here. Yeah. Julius is my brother. Julius my liver. I want to give a shout out to Julius because <laughs> Julius says one thing that's very true. Yeah. We need to get our hands on the, the, the means of production. 
Okay? Yeah. If you want to create wealth, you have to get your hands on the means of production. Most people are trying to get their hands on money. I don't want money. I want assets. Right? So money is not a, it's not, it's not even a store of wealth. Money is purely transactional. Money is a way for you and I to transact. I have some notes, you have something I want, I give you the notes, you give me the something I want. But when I've, if you've got that money in your account now, and you go, well, I'm, I've, I've got 20 million in my account, so now I'm wealthy. No, you're not. Because you're sitting in a highly depreciating asset that loses value over time. Money, ha it loses value. If you go buy something today, it's way more expensive in a year's time from now. 10 years from now, you're going to look back and go, that was really cheap. Money devalues over time. So money is not wealth, right? Money is the way we transact. That's all it is. It's not even a store of wealth because it's subject to deflation. So if you want to generate wealth, you've got to have the thing that makes the money. So Asset. Interesting, right? If I pick up a guy now, let's say I take a guy from the street yeah. and I hand over a hundred million rands to that guy. Yeah. But you and I are basically agreeing on, are you saying the guy is not really a millionaire? No. No, can you go because, because, because it's fictitious. It's fictitious. If the government decides to print a crap load more of that stuff tomorrow, and this is the other thing, don't own things that people can print more of. You want to you wanna own hard assets. That's how wealth is generated. You can print the property. Exactly. Yeah. You can't print natural resources, right? Like gold, silver. Now, that's an interesting discussion because I'll tell you about my three principles of what makes an investment. Which, which will be re very relevant for your audience. We'll get into that in a second. But that is subject to a moment's change, right? If the banking system collapses and his money is in the bank, gone. This is why I say don't ever hold your wealth in the bank. A bank is purely a way for you and I to transact. The bank is a, is a third party for you and I to transact. But if you're storing wealth in the bank, if you think that's storing wealth, you're not. It's a depreciating asset, and I say asset in air quotes because it's actually not an asset. Uh, more importantly, if the government prints more of it, it's subject, it is very volatile, subjective to change. And most importantly, what does money do? It does nothing other than allowing us to transact, right? So here's my three rules for an investment, for it to be an investment. It must hold value today. It must have future value, appreciation. And most importantly, it must cash flow, right? So if you hold gold and silver as an example, what is gold and silver? It's not an asset. It's a store of wealth yeah. because it has value today. It will arguably have higher value in the future, right? Mm -hmm. But it does not cash flow. Yeah. There, are, there are very limited things that cash flow, and it comes down to two things, property and business. Yeah. Sometimes shares, dividends. But, no, but hang on. Yeah. This is what people don't understand. You're not buying a share or a dividend. What are you buying? You're buying a business. You're buying a business. Yeah. And when you look at it accordingly, you don't buy on the share price, you buy on the value of the asset, which is a company. Absolutely. So how does a layman actually get to understand that? To say that the store of wealth is supposed to be in a business that I'm starting, that cash flows, property investment portfolio, that grows in value. A lot of people hear people like you speaking and they're like, oh, well, I mean, I'm not him. If I'm black, I'll say, I'm not white. I didn't come from privilege. And then another one will say, I don't understand anything about business or property investing. Oh, I need a million bucks to invest in property. Well, there's the problem, right? Yeah. So, so the number one thing that people should invest in is education. Somebody comes to me and says, I've got 5,000 bucks a month or 1,000 bucks or 500 bucks a month to invest. Where should I invest? They probably expect me to say something like stock, shares, property, crypto, whatever. I say, no, my man, go get some education. You can't buy, invest, or participate in something you don't understand. You know why most people lose money in the property market? Because they don't understand what they're buying. You know why most people lose money in stocks and shares? Because they don't know what the fuck they bought in the first place, right? <laughs> you know why most, most people get their ass handed to them in crypto? Mm -hmm. They don't even know what the fuck crypto is, really. They don't understand the, the fundamental layers of it, yeah. right? So how can you invest and buy into anything that you don't understand in the first instance? You've got to go get the education first. The, the most important thing you can invest in is education. I used to read seven books a week, a book a day, right? 
I don't read as much anymore. And we actually had a very interesting discussion around it because I feel like I've got most of my foundational knowledge in, in tact and I've practiced it and proved that I understand it. So one thing to read a book, like you can recite something to me out of a book and sound really intelligent. The difference is I want to see you have done it. Have you done the Have you done it? About? And this is the problem. We've got a whole bunch of fucking people, especially this younger generation, reciting shit out of books that they read. But these guys have never got their, their hands wet. They've never got their hands wet. They've never got the their hands dirty. Practical. You've got to prove you can practically do it, right? Yeah. And so the first thing you should be investing in is don't ever buy a stock or a share if you don't know how to value a company. Brother, if you don't know how to read a balance sheet, don't ever fucking buy a stock. If you don't know how to calculate the internal rates of return, don't ever buy a property. If you don't understand that your house is a is a your primary residence you know, is a liability. You know, no so if you don't know how to calculate an internal rate of return, don't invest in property. Right? If you don't understand the kind of property you're investing into, if you don't understand the future value of the property, if you don't understand the property market around it, if you don't understand the macroeconomic picture. Right? If you don't understand the financial industry, don't be buying fucking property. And included in that, you have to understand business because you have to understand cash flow. Even on the property side. On everything, right? If you're going to put money into something, you need to understand how it works. How many people do I meet every day that go, I've invested money, I'm with a broker, and I say, where's the money? No, it's in some unit trust. Okay, what does the unit trust own? Well, I don't fucking know. Well, how do you put your money somewhere you don't know? Ah, 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 that's a way to lose money. Mm -hmm. And then you hear the same people say, oh, the broker did me in, I lost money. No, 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 no. You were the idiot. You lost the money. You didn't understand what you were buying. Do people actually look at it that way and say, oh, I'm the idiot, I'm the one who did No, they don't. Because no. that's like, the For problem. instance, I'm asking because what you're talking about, it's, ex it's exactly what happened to you 20 years ago. Yeah. You yep. built up your business, you have become a millionaire, you tried to grow your money with other people that you wanted to partner with. They took all your money and left you homeless. Yep. And here you are saying, you actually admit that actually I was the idiot because I didn't 100%. know what I was doing. 100%. I had to go back to school. I, I understood immediately total and utter accountability. This is something that's lacking in our society. It's something that's lacking in community. It's something that's lacking in the home. We don't take accountability for our mistakes. It's always somebody else. We're fucking victims, right? Mm -hmm. we, we're surrounded by a country of victims. You just have to look at the political landscape. Everyone's a fucking victim. You're too black. I'm too white. She's too short. You know, yeah. like this is the game we're playing and it's bullshit. People need to take some accountability. If you fucked up and you made a mistake, you need to look at it and go, what can I learn from this? What can I take from this? Because I don't make mistakes. I make learning opportunities. Yeah. Can you go more on that? I don't make mistakes. I make learning opportunities. Every opportunity that you have to learn comes from failure. We do not learn when things are going well. When the bills are paid, when you're driving a nice car, when you're in a nice house, when everything's going good, business is going good, you go and sit at Conca and drink. That's what happens, right? But when things are going shit, when you're hustling, when you're grinding, when you've got to figure it out, that's when you learn. The magic is when your back is up against the wall. That's why I don't want to ever be comfortable. I constantly put myself in a position of discomfort. I gamble and I gamble big. Mm. I make smart gambles. Yeah. I don't risk the house. It doesn't mean literally, you guys. You not literally. I, I, I don't gamble. gambling is not a business no, or a property. But I'm saying I gamble big on opportunity. Yeah. And I, and, I, and I calculate risk and I'm a numbers guy and I know the odds and I, and, I, and, I, and I look at things from a business perspective, but I never hold myself back because of fear. Fear of failing. Because if I fail, there is something I needed to fail and learn from. When you, when, when you made your first million mm. and, and you lost it, you said something to me, you then became driven by two things, which is greed and fear. Those are the things that led me to lose money. Yeah. What were you fearing then? Fearing. Because I assume if somebody has made money, right, there could be a position of comfortability to say, Correct. now I'm comfortable enough to go for other opportunities and grow my business. Yeah. But now you say, but now I was fearful. With all this money that I had, I was fearful. Well, there was an opportunity in front of me. And my fear was that if I didn't take that opportunity, I would regret not taking it. It's a different kind of fear. It's a different kind of fear. Yeah. 
And what made me make that decision was greed because the opportunity was so good and so big that the greed drove me to override my logic. Those are two things that drive every cup decision. So the greed drove you to override your thinking. My logic. Your logic, right? And it always does. Mm -hmm. And fear pushed me to that point of making a decision. But it works in a lot of different ways, right? A lot of people see, like let's say property investing, a lot of people will never pull the trigger on buying a property because they've got fear. They don't want to lose money. They don't understand things. So they, they have a fear of going into it. Right? And then the greed holds them back from putting money into the property market because they want to hang on to the cash because they think the cash is wealth. Or they come out and do what you did and say, I don't want to lose that property opportunity. I'm going to put all my money exactly. into it so that I could make more money. Exactly. So how does one then build up the right mindset to balance out those two? Because it's like two different ends. Education. Yeah. Uh, and this is one part I love. Education, make sure you understand what it is that you're investing into. And the second part is always go back to the numbers. The numbers never lie. If you look at numbers, and this is why I love numbers so much, I'm a, I'm a numbers fanatic, right? You'll see I've got uh, three bands on my arm. Yeah, I've got one. You've got one, but I've got three. And my, my handle is money chart 21. Two plus one is three. I believe in quantum physics. And all things created in this world are in the patterns three, six, and nine, which is a very interesting conversation. I love numbers. Numbers to me is my mental escape. And I found that numbers take us away from the emotion and takes us towards the logic. And when you do the calculations and you understand how to do calculations, the emotion's out of it. So I'll give you a great example in personal finance. If you run a budget and you say, I only have so much money to spend for this, this, and this each month. There is no going to the shop and then trying to justify it yourself, but I can afford it. No, what does the spreadsheet say? Can I afford it or can't I afford it? And the numbers tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Numbers don't lie. Numbers don't lie. Yeah. Unless you've got a dodgy accountant, but the numbers <laughs> generally, generally don't lie. But you see, a lot of people don't like, I like going back to what you just said and what you said before. You said, if you don't understand how to read a balance sheet, don't buy into shares or don't hundred percent right so then you're ultimately saying go back to the basics and the basics is is develop yourself in the area of knowledge correct yeah. but what kind of knowledge because people are going to school oh that's the biggest mistake people are going to school and that's the biggest piling mistake. up degrees oh. and then here you are saying get some knowledge and the guy says what are you talking about i've got a phd so so the single Largest group of people that ask for financial mentorship from me are lawyers, doctors, dentists. The largest group of people are lawyers, dentists. And, and doctors, doctors who are asking for financial advice. People who send me messages. Why do you think that is? Why, because why because, because I live in the world of academia. And academia has got nothing to do with practicality. Right? 90% mm -hmm. of the shit that you were taught at school, A, you don't remember it. And B, has no relevance to where you live today. Maths helped you a bit. Language helped a bit. History, well, not really too much because none of us really... I can give. Google history. I don't need to. Thank you. And what yeah. happened in 1947? No one really gives a crap, right? Mm -hmm. In geography, maybe if you're using maps, it might help you a little bit. What we should be teaching our kids at school is how to sell and how to manage money. Because irrespective of your career path, if you can sell, you can manage money. If you're, if you're a lawyer, you can sell yourself. If you're a doctor, you can sell yourself. Right? I know lawyers and doctors that don't know the first thing about selling themselves, right? Because they've, they, they believe the system has taught them. And this is, this is a deep discussion, but this is the ultimate level of imperialism that's been imposed on modern man, yeah. right? Is go get an education, then come out and you'll have a good job, right? And work for some paper money so that you can go and buy some food. We've commercialized food, we've commercialized water, we've commercialized everything. We've exchanged the, the whips and chains of slavery for money and giving people the illusion of choice. And this is where the education system fails us. The education system does not want us to be financially literate. Otherwise, it would be a building block of education at school. Yeah. So when you say financial, you're financially literate and... Okay, maybe let me ask, ask it this way. Can you break it down in simple terms for somebody who's watching? Somebody's watching and you're saying, 
the, the education system does not want us to be financially literate. Yeah. What exactly does it mean to be financially literate? To understand how the financial system works, to understand what money is. Everybody's so focused on creating wealth. And I know people with a lot of money, right? A lot of cash. And they think they understand money. And I say to them, you don't understand money. You don't understand wealth. I'll tell you what, tell me the history of money. Most people can't tell me the history of money. How can you aim to accumulate something you don't even understand? You didn't even study properly. It was never the end goal. That's the point, right? And so when I talk about financial literacy, I break it down for people. I say, you cannot build a house if you don't lay foundations. You got to put foundations down before you can build a house. Okay. And if you want to build a double story, you need bigger foundations, which means you need to go back and study money, understand the financial system, understand the deep layering in the financial system. I mean, I could say things here that will blow the back of your head off that most people don't even understand. Mm-hmm. Right. And it'll just leave people perplexed. That's not what I want to do. I want to make sure people go and understand what do they do today that can make them financially free. It's very simple. Very, very simple. Yeah. Can we get your, to that? your earned income is the single greatest catalyst for wealth. Earned income, the job that you have, money that you're getting in, is the single greatest catalyst for wealth. And let me explain why. Because you need cash flow to build something, right? You can't build it just out of nothing. You can start out of nothing, but ultimately to build, you need money, right? It's a resource, like land, like water, like electricity. It's a resource. So you need to get as much of it as possible to build the stuff you want to build. But here's what everybody's doing. Paycheck comes, 100% of the money is gone. Most people, 120% of the money is gone. They're going backwards every month, right? You have to learn how to live on less for as long as possible so you can accumulate money. So my rule is you should never live on more than 50% of what you earn. Mm -hmm. Half of what you earn should be going to building your own bank. What do we mean by building your own bank? So you don't have to take debt. So that you have money to build stuff, right? Then we talk about taking on debt. You should never take on debt on a primary source of income. Now, what is a primary source of income? You wake up every day, you go to a job, you get paid. And now (laughs) you go buy a house, which is a net outflow of cash, a primary residence. You buy that house on your primary income and you bond that house for 20 years. So you're you're essentially saying, I'm committing to this income for 20 years. I'm confident that for the next 20 years, I will earn an income, right? (laughs) Wealthy people don't make debt on primary income. Wealthy people take 50% of what they earn, take that money, put it into buying assets that generate money. Use that money, that income, to make debt on that income. They make debt on secondary sources of income. And that's how you build wealth. So if somebody starts out in their job in their 20s and they say, just then I've just got a job and I'm a lawyer, doctor, engineer, I'm earning 100,000 rand. What should I be doing? Live at home for as long as possible. Pay your parents really well. Pay your parents really well. Yeah? Instead of going and paying rent somewhere else because it's also part of generational wealth. Keep it in the family. Mm-hmm. Okay? Live there as long as possible. Accumulate as much money as you can. And every month, first get the education on what it is you want to invest in. Do you want to invest in property? Go do courses. Go do seminars. Go read books. Go study. Go get around successful people in property. Take on mentorship. Learn your craft just like you did when you went to go study to become a lawyer, right? Go study. Somebody who understands the thing you want to invest into. Get that knowledge and then go and invest into something. Like let's say it's property. Go buy a property. And get a couple of those properties under the belt that when you want to go and buy your nice house, it doesn't cost you a cent because you're going, you're going to bond that house to the max. Use the bank's money. Mm-hmm. But every month it's being paid for by somebody else's rent. Yeah. So what, how did you develop this mindset? Because a lot of people, black or white, don't know the stuff that you're talking about. through experience, through learning, through making mistakes. Nothing that I know comes from a book. Everything I know comes from making mistakes, from going, I was over-indebted here. I was was making debts on primary income. It doesn't make sense. I've I've got to figure out, I need other people's money, 
But how do I how do I ensure that if my income stops coming, I continue to live? Okay, I need a second source of income. What can I invest in that gives me a second source of income? <laughs> That's why I started 109 businesses. People go, hey, you started 109 businesses. Uh, well, what's wrong with you? I started 109 businesses because here's the thing. Let's say you start a garden service. You're cutting lawn. Hey, what are you going to do in winter? The grass is not growing, my man. Yeah. Right? So you, so you need a winter business. You understand. It's called hedging. So now you've got, you, you, you've got the summer business, you need a winter business. And that's why I developed 109 businesses because I went, if one thing succeeds and something else fails, this thing that's succeeding is going to hold this thing up that's failing for a little bit until it can succeed. Now I've got a question. Uh, a lot of people do talk about that, uh, multiple streams of income. Mm -hmm. But what I've seen uh, talking to wealthy people, being around wealthy people, those guys don't diversify until they're actual millionaires. And most, then, most of them, they diversify once one business has done really well and they start building many more businesses. So, and, and they talk about they've got a base, a base business mm -hmm. that they build mm -hmm. that succeeds and then they start diversifying, right? So did you diversify right from the start and disprove what they say or did you do the diversification exactly how they do it? That diversification story that they talk about is some rich people shit, mm -hmm. right? When you come from nothing, you quickly realize the only thing keeping you off the streets is money. I was hungry, brother. I had no time to fucking wait to diversify. I had to diversify as quickly as possible. Because yes, I'm making money today, but I know if I stop making money today, I'm back on that street. On street yeah. So no, 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 no. There's no waiting, right? You sitting on your ass on the weekend watching DSTV, watching Netflix. I mean, this, this shit bends my mind. I go past shacks and they all got DSTV dishes. They do, yeah. Come on, come on, guys. Pull your head out your ass. But is someone not trying to deliver it to you? <laughs> Make them stay at home and not rush. Pull, pull, pull your head out your ass, right? Yeah. You need to be hustling on the weekend, right? You need to be figuring out, okay, I've got a job during the week. What can I do on the weekend to get a second source of income in? Diversification. Diversification, right? You, 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 you're starting a business. Okay, I'm all in on the business. But fuck, you still got to pay the bills. Go get a job at night. Go be a waiter, go be a waitress, go go start something at the flea market on the weekend, go go hustle on the street corner, go sell something, right? Go pick up a bucket and a sponge and wash cars in a shopping center on a weekend. Who are you that you think you're so fucking entitled and privileged, right? That you're gonna just rely on one source of income. That's what that's what I tell myself. That's what I tell myself. I'm not talking to anyone else, I'm talking to myself. Mm -hmm. How do I think I'm so entitled that I can just rely on that one thing? No, 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 no. Until I'm financially free, I must get off my ass and hustle. If that means me working four jobs, if two, four flats, I still got money. Because the only thing keeping me out of the street is this thing, money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's also a mindset of growth. How, do, how does one build that growth mindset? Failure. You gotta fail, and and this is. A, is it now intentional failure? Yes, it, sometimes it is. Sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes it is. Okay. Um, I I put myself in in very precarious situations sometimes, where I'm intentionally challenging myself, intention, because I know there's something there that I need to learn. Mm -hmm. So I I heard you now say something concerning. Clean up your contract. <laughs> you saw that clip, right? I saw a clip for you. African people don't like <laughs> it for this, man. No, we come from a background where you literally have to, most of the time, it's insinuated that you must get married in community of property. Yep. I was one of the few that in my community that got married out of. So only time but, I vote ANC. That's the only time. <laughs> <laughs> anti nuptial contract. Yeah. So... <laughs> That that's a part of asset protection in and of itself. Yeah. Right. Not even against divorce or anything, mm. but literally protecting the family. Can you go deep on that? And I, I think this is a that? very deep conversation, right? So I, I want to I want to take this back a couple of layers before we get to the the money side of things because mm -hmm. I think there's a deeper thing here. Sure. My wife and I have both been married previously. Sure. And we then got married second time to each other, and we saw the mistakes of getting divorced. We saw what happens. The person you marry is not the person you divorce. The person you marry is happy, they love you, you get divorced, you quickly see it all turns to money. So about who gets what, and, and especially can the kids be used as leverage to get money from the other partner. There's a lot of things that go into it, right? So we, we 
wrote a divorce contract, not a prenup, not a prenup, not an anti-natural contract, although we have that in place. Not, not ANC. We had a divorce agreement. We went and we wrote out a divorce agreement and put it with the lawyers. Listen, if we get divorce, this agreement's already in place. Now, a lot of, a lot of people said, oh, then why even get married? I'll tell you why. Because when you write a contract like that, you very quickly see who the other person is. Immediately. You immediately see it. Show me how you spend your time. Show me how you spend your money. Show me how you carry your wallet. I'll tell you who you are. Right? That's my, th that's my thing. And so we wrote a divorce agreement. And we very quickly saw who we were. Right? So that's really important. You get to know who you really marry. That's so important. Because the partner you put your head down next to is going to have the biggest impact on your life forever. You wake up in the morning, if he or she's in a bad mood, you're going to be in a bad mood. Right? So that's very, very important. Then when we talk about, about, about the actual money side and anti-natural contracts, I've got a very simple belief. I don't ever want to be with a partner who's entirely financially dependent on me. Because then the question becomes, are they with me because of the income and the money? Mm. So I want to retire my wife as quickly as possible in a marriage, financially. Yeah. Make them financially independent. And then that agreement should reflect that. The end of this marriage, you get yours, I get mine. But the reason why it becomes a fight at the end, because there's usually one dominant financial person. Person, yeah. And that's where the attack starts. So we have to shift our mindset. And for men, I want to say this because I can't talk as a woman. I can only talk as a man. As a man, you need to understand that your partner brings a certain degree of responsibility to the home, the way they raise your kids, the energy they provide in the home, the way they look after you. If they disappear tomorrow, for whatever reason, death, cancer, whatever, right? Cheat on you, whatever it is. What will it take for you to replace that person? Quantified as a number, financial, and you'll be horrified what that's going to cost you. Hmm. Make no mistake, marriage is a business. And how does marriage play a role in helping you build or destroy your world? The, the, the person you marry is the single most important choice you will ever make financially. If you marry someone who does not have the same value system as you financially, who doesn't have the same outlook as you, they don't have to say have the same intellect, but they have to have the same value system. They must want not money, but freedom. If you're hanging around chicks who only want Gucci and Prada, sorry for you, your life's going to be shit. If you, want, if you find a partner who wants freedom, who wants to wake up and have stuff taken care of, that's a completely different partner. Because even when the work is done, it's done with a sense of freedom in mind. 100%. It is not money I've ever chased. It is freedom I've chased and it is freedom I teach. And it's the assets that buy you the freedom. 100%. Yeah. So then, how does one actually ensure that when they do get married and they have a family, that builds up their mindset to be tuned towards wealth? Let's say people are already married. Mm -hmm. They love each other. Mm -hmm. But their thinking is different. One wants freedom, one wants, one wants product. How do you then, and they come to you for coaching, how do you then help them to make Happens all without the time. forcing the other party? Happens all the time. Yeah. You have to pick a lane. Did you marry the right person? If not, get divorced, move on. I know people don't want to hear this. Mm. You, 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 can't, you can't turn something into something that it's not. So if our values, if we married for 10 years and 10 years later, we find out that we're not aligned, well, we must go our separate ways. We must go our separate ways. And the problem is so many people sink themselves trying to save something that's not worth saving. Mm -hmm. I have this discussion with people all the time. They say, it's too late for me. I'm already married. So it's never too late. It's never too late to be brave enough to make a different choice. But you have to decide because in life, everything is about you have to give up something to get something. Everything. You, you want to be, be in shape, so you've got to give up cake. Right? Absolutely. You want to be financially free, you've got to give up consumerism. There's always a price to pay. There's a sense. price to pay. And you have to decide, is the thing that you want worth the price to pay? And some people say, you know what, I'm just going to, my wife loves Prada, I'm going to be a slave to it because I love her more than I love becoming financially free. That's okay. But you gave something up here to get something here. Mm. And that's okay. That's your choice. 
But I'm telling you, the two will never meet. It's an opportunity cost. Basically. It's an opportunity cost. 100%. The two will never meet. So I can tell that you've got a very strong mindset. Mm. And, and not many people have that kind of mindset. A lot of, especially nowadays. Yeah. Right? How does one develop their mindset to be at that level? Right? I, you've bounced back from losing all your money. You've bounced back from divorce. A lot of men are finished by yeah. divorce. Yeah, right? you're so, right. And, and you've bounced back from those things. What sort of, what drives that mindset? And what can people, what are the things that you can share with people that you know have helped you to rebuild when you lost your marriage, when you lost your business, when you lost everything? Stop being a victim and take total and utter accountability. Stop allowing yourself to blame anything else. Stop allowing yourself to blame the ex-wife, the ex-husband, the ex-business partner. Stop blaming other people. Stop being a victim. Look in the mirror and say, I am responsible for every choice I make, good or bad. When I buy the Rolls Royce, it's my fault. When I lose all my money, it's my fault. (laughs) You know, you're reminding me of something. Someone said, we are all self-made. Only successful people admit it. 100%. 100%. This is, why I have a pro- this is why I have a problem with a politician driving a Maybach. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. I don't care if a businessman drives a Maybach. I have a problem when it's on my tax money. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it comes from that total and utter accountability. I believe that entrepreneurs are the backbone to changing the world. I don't believe it's done through policy and, and government. I think they assist the process if they do it correctly. Yeah. But government has no business being in business. Entrepreneurs will change the world because the flow of money is what determines our creativity and our ingenuity to solve problems. We have to be rewarded for the problems we solve. Mm-hmm. And part of that process of being an entrepreneur, and I think that's potentially even the deeper thing that's made me who I am, is being an entrepreneur, I've got no one else to fucking blame. <laughs> if something goes wrong, it's my, it's my fault. If your staff don't get paid, whose fault is it? My fault. It's your fault, yeah. right? If you don't get sales through the door tomorrow, is it your salespeople or is it you? It's your fault. The buck stops with me. When you take total and utter accountability, and then people say, well, that's fine, but you're an entrepreneur. What if I'm an employee? And I say, there's nothing wrong. In fact, I will tell you the most guaranteed path to financial freedom is actually being employed, not being self-employed. Mm-hmm. Because being employed is generally a linear path. You earn and you earn and you earn and you earn. And a you, promotion. Exactly. Yeah. And if you're diligent in putting your money away, you will retire financially free. An entrepreneur's journey is like this, up and down, up and down, up and down. Yeah. You will go, but most dollar millionaires go bankrupt eight times. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So it's not a, it's not a direct path. And so it's a tough path, actually. It's, one of the it's the hardest path, path anyone can take. You need to be a bit fucked in the head to be yeah. an entrepreneur. Yeah. You've got to like pain. I mean, you've got a good job going on and you leave the job to go start a business. Exactly, right? From zero. Exactly. So I, I say, and so entrepreneurs say, uh, they say, but you're an entrepreneur, that's an entrepreneur mindset. No, let me give you the employee mindset. Why are you employed? And people will come up with, oh, because I've got a degree and this. No, you're not employed for eight hours a day. You're not employed because you have a degree. You're employed because you deliver something to the bottom line of the business. You're employed for a result. So if you're an employee out there and you want to make more money, you want to become financially free, here's the path. Figure out how to add more value to the business that employs you. Make yourself absolutely so valuable you cannot be removed. And that's how you make more money. It's a value exchange. Do you agree with the fact that even during retrenchments, that certain people, business people will never retrench? Because of, of the value that those people bring into the business. 100%. No matter how bad the business is going, I'd rather like forego my own salary yes. to give it to that guy. Yes. Because I want to keep that guy. Well, on my second and third run at business, I started employing people from Microsoft and Google because they were far more intelligent than I was, right? <laughs> and I was sitting eating baked beans on toast for Christmas Eve when they were earning 13 checks. You know why? Because they were more valuable than I was. That's a hard pill to swallow for an interpreter, right? Of course. You realize that the guy that I'm hiring is actually more valuable than me. So I must be humble enough to take my salary and give it to him and not have a salary. The, the thing of being an entrepreneur is that it is the most selfless act on the planet. Because whether you like it or not, 
you have to get paid last. Everybody else has to get paid first. Your suppliers, your staff, your everyone. This is why I have a problem with these tender entrepreneurs who go out there, get a tender. First fucking thing they do is off to the Range Rover shop. They haven't staff even first. haven't even paid staff, haven't even bought the equipment, haven't even bought the material to do the job, but we're buying a Range Rover. That's my problem. As an entrepreneur, you come last. And through that selfless act, if you prepare to sacrifice and give of yourself for a couple of decades, man, you can be rewarded beautifully. So there's nothing wrong with actually getting a tent. The problem is how you actually do the tent. Exactly. Right? Because you can get the tender, put the employees ahead, first, put the business put first, put the client first, put the client first, which is the government. Yep. Deliver on the work. Correct. Get paid some more. Yep. Take the money, buy some assets, and buy yourself a range room. Correct. So you can still get that range room. And there's a lot of there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there doing that, but it's not the majority. Yeah, the majority get quick money. And and listen, I've got I've got a, a wonderful friend, Mr. Latuli, who says something to me that I love. He says to me, You must understand. You white guys, there's something wrong with you. You want to go camping every weekend. Mm. I've been camping my whole life. I want five yeah. stop. What's wrong with you guys? <laughs> <laughs> and so I understand it. I, un I really understand the cultural aspects of money. I understand that not having and not having. And that's why I say this generation that's coming through is a little bit fucked because they, they're working on what they didn't have and trying to enjoy it. But we need to fix the next generation. Because if we don't fix the next generation, we don't create true generational wealth. The and we will become will be enslaved. Missed. The whole country will be missed. 100%. So I've got seven of your books. Yep. Right? I mention the title and you give me an explanation about the book. Yep. Right? Cryptocurrency demystified. It's all bullshit. It's, a, it's, it's, pr it's fake. It's not real. Big money. But what is real is the blockchain. The blockchain is where you need to focus. Decentralization. That's the future. It's not crypto. Tell, tell us more on that. For us to do a transaction in the traditional finance space, we have to, with, we have to act through a third party, the bank. Yeah. The blockchain allows you and I to transact directly. And I'm going to give it to you in a sense that you can understand it properly. Imagine we don't need a deeds office. We can do the deal directly and... Boom, the world has changed forever. And it goes to every layer of transaction. It would be quicker, money would exchange hands quicker. Less cost. Less cost. More accountability. Yeah. Transparency. Hmm. Stock investing secrets? Don't buy the stock, buy the company. Don't buy the stock, buy the company. Compound interest secrets. Albert Einstein said it's the eighth wonder of the world. Yeah. Those who understand it, earn it. Those who don't, pay it. <laughs> Those who don't understand it, pay, pay it. it. Yeah. Money secret. Everything you've been taught about money is wrong. It's not about money. It's about energy. Okay. Money is a transfer of energy. And money is not wealth. Money is transactional. You don't want to have money. You want to have assets. My thing in life is to make as much cash as possible, as quickly as possible, and then to put it into assets. I don't keep my money and my wealth in the bank. In summary, so if someone is watching now, you're saying to them, don't go for go for the money, but only to use it to buy assets. 100%. Because that's the main You've got to save up some money in the bank yeah. and then use that money for something. So we don't keep it there forever? Hell no. My grandmother keeps it in the mattress. Is she, is she wrong? Of course. What happened to Pablo Escobar when he stored his money under, under the fields in the South America? The rats ate the money. You know, true story, right? I wish, I wish my grandmother knew some of the things that you are saying now. 100%. Because when you were growing up, my grandmother, although she was working for the city of Joburg as a cleaner, mm. she had like a tavern in Alexander and she was making a lot of money. Yeah. Right? Um, and I, I used to stay in, in a place called Klephat in the Northwest back in the day. Yeah. My grandmother would literally come with money, with a big bucket like this, and put money in it and bury it. Oh, God. <laughs> I kid you not. And say, when I come back next month, I'm going to take the money out to get you guys some stuff. Now, let's change that narrative yeah. for one generation. Imagine she took those tavern profits and bought a laundromat, and then took the laundromat profits. 
and bought the shop on the corner. And then with those profits, bought the property. Yeah. How different would your life be today? My grandmother would be one of the wealthiest people you know. Because she didn't understand yeah. money's transaction. It's transactional. She thought the money is the actual thing. And in actual fact, somebody defrauded her of 500,000 rands in the year 2000. How much money was that it's back then? Yeah? That is a lot of money. Probably in today's value, would be like what, 5 million? And I just want to say this. This is why you and I are conjured for a message. To break the generational curses, yeah. you have to educate. Hmm. To break the generational curses, we have to educate. So, in actual fact, you are saying that ignorance is a curse. 100%. It ain't bliss. It's a curse. It's a curse. Hey, we've changed it, guys. Ignorance is a curse, not a bliss. 100%. All right? How to retire rich? Understand that retiring rich is about designing your lifestyle up front. The person who wants to retire with a mega yacht and a helicopter has to have very different goals than the person who wants to retire by the beach or by the river or by the bush with a simple house and simple things. So I tell people design your retirement up front and work towards it. When you get money and you get wealth, you understand that your possessions possess you. And there is no state of permanence around ownership. We never own anything, actually. Mm -hmm. We are simply custodians, and I'll give you the greatest example. Yeah. When you first make money, you buy an apartment or you get into an apartment, right? Then you get 2.3 children, you need a bigger house. So you get rid of the apartment, you get a house. Then the children leave the house. Then you want to go back to the apartment. Then you go back to the apartment, you get old, the knees don't work. Okay, you can't go upstairs, stairs. you got to be... Nothing is permanent. Yeah. So design and live your life for the end, not for now. Most people are living for the now, live for when you're old. Because at 65, you stop the ability to earn money, most people. So live not for now, live for when you're getting older. Marriage and money? <laughs> divorce touchy, contract, divorce, touchy subject. Divorce, divorce contract up front, make sure that you are both financially independent and then you'll really know what love is about. Hmm. Both must be financially independent. Correct. That doesn't mean that he or she both have... Tip, my view is, because I'm a strong alpha male, I believe the man should work and the woman should raise the children. And the reason why I believe that is because I don't want my kids being poisoned by an education system with both parents working and we give our kids over to somebody else to indoctrinate them. I'm going to indoctrinate my own children. Thank you very much. So my wife must be the the core matriarch in the home, I must provide. But having said that, I must make sure she's retired financially because then we're both independent. Absolutely. Passive income secrets? Never, ever, ever, ever live your life on a primary source of income. You need to make passive income. And when you get passive income, you can become financially free. Financial freedom is not about a number in the bank. People think if I've got 10 million, I'm financially free. No, you're not. If you have money that comes at you every month and you don't have to exchange labor for it and it covers your bills, you're financially free. That's mm -hmm. passive income. Absolutely. So what we usually do when we end off the show is for you to look at the viewer at home and, and give them the core message. Justin's core message. Mm -hmm. Spend less than you earn. Very important. If you do not spend less than you earn, you're always going to be enslaved. Understand that money is just like any other resource, like water out of the tap. If you leave that tap open, it will eventually run dry. Money is a resource. And thirdly and most importantly, when you spend money, you don't buy things. You buy emotions. You buy a feeling. And people spend the most amount of money to impress the people they like least. So stop being a dumbass and take control of your money. Stop being a dumbass. <laughs> All right, guys. That was the most, one of the most amazing, amazing interviews I've ever had on the, on the winner's circle. And we are all starstruck in the studio right now. And we're saying, uh, Justin, amazing work that you're doing. Thank you, brother. I appreciate, I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your message. May it grow to reach more people. Right? We hope so. May more Africans' eyes be open to me, people buy assets, me, people grow their businesses. And yeah, we will build a prosperous society and a prosperous country. 
because I can I can feel it in you, man. That's what you want. 100%. You know, so thank you for gracing us with your presence. And yeah, remember to like the video, comment, let us know what your thoughts are. First hit the like button. Yeah. Make sure you subscribe. Yeah. Drop us a comment down below. We yeah. want to hear from you. All right. And that's it from me and Justin. It's more than just money. Have a lovely, lovely, lovely day. Cheers. Yeah. That's it from us. Ah. <laughs> Kill us, guys. Good, man. Ah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> we could go on and on. And